All right, what's up, Hot Squad? And welcome back to my Heart Banging Recap Marathon. So we're gonna check out another Who's the Boss recap, and this one's called I Brought Every PlayStation to Hell Ever. So I actually previously did his last one, his home console recap. Love that one. And seeing the PlayStation handheld always gonna feel so nostalgic as hell because I actually own the PSP and the PS Vita to this day. So it's like, damn, man, this is gonna feel nostalgic as hell. So you know what, Hot Squad? Let's jump right into it. We're gonna check out Mr. Who's the Boss PlayStation handheld recap right now. Let's check it out. Hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it, get it, get it, get it, get it. I just bought every single PlayStation handheld ever released, mm. which is actually a lot more than you might think. Because you've heard of the PSP, but this yes. was actually not Sony's first handheld. Released in 1999 for the equivalent of just under $40 today, Sony marketed this little guy as a cross between a memory card for the PS1 and a digital personal assistant. I never owned a pocket station. But what makes this step technically first handheld is that it can also play its own games. This thing is minuscule. The buttons aren't even labels, probably because you wouldn't be able to read them anyways. It's got some pretty simple clock and calendar functions, that's the digital assistant side of things. But then if you want to play games, you have to download content from a compatible PS1 game. Like this. I believe. Look at that from the bottom. Hey, look at that. It's going to go into the memory card slot. And that is our game downloaded. What a weird process. Hmm. You, see, you flick right from the home screen oh, and that enters you into Crash World, at which point you get three different games to choose from. And they are all in Japanese. Hmm. This must be from Japan, because I don't think they'll have this in America. They have done such a good job distilling the platforming feel of Crash Bandicoot. It's a 2D top-down game with a 32 pixel width, and yet it's so clear at all times what's going on. This pocket station definitely makes you feel the whole constraint breeds creativity notion. And wow, look at the jump! Kind of insane. Got a very basic speaker at the back. Just classic 8-bit sounds. It's no, um, Dolby Atmos. Hardware doesn't feel very hard wearing, but mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see at what point in this journey the quality of material picks up. In terms of specs, I describe the pocket station as uh, cute. Mm -hmm. It's able to run this dinky little Crash Bandicoot virtual pet game thanks to a very basic 33 kilohertz CPU and two kilobytes of RAM, with an LCD screen capable of 32 by 32 resolution. But what's actually quite cool is that since it doubles as your PS1 memory card, it's packing 128 kilobytes of storage, which these days is everything you could possibly need. But what really made this conversation a hit was the IR sensor at the top, which granted it multiplayer capabilities with other pocket stations, giving it the same kind of playground appeal as the Game Boy, or I guess more aptly, the Tamagotchi. The pocket station sold just under 5 million units in its lifespan, which is actually huge when you realize that Sony only ever released it in one country. They never expanded beyond that because at no point did they ever manage to even keep up with the demand just from Japan. You can totally see how the pocket station was what laid the foundations for them to build their next console. Because if you didn't know about the pocket station, the decision for Sony to launch the PSP in 2005... Almost 20 years? What the actual? 20 years? I don't know, it's insane. Because while there'd always been a raging battle for the home console space, the handheld market was basically owned by one company and one company only. Nintendo. Nintendo had not just got the Game Boy, by the most successful console on the planet at the time under their belts, yes. but had also then followed it up with the Game Boy Advance, yes. which was a beast of a console that also broke records, and yes. just recently topped that all off with the Nintendo yes. DS, yes. their next-gen handheld with two screens, a stylus, and proper 3D graphics. Mm. This was a real David and Goliath situation, mm. so Sony had to make sure that they were offering something unique. Mm -hmm. How did they do that? Well, they took Nintendo's own ad campaigns from their previous Game Boy Advance that flaunted how Thing could do. Console quality anywhere. Questionable claim, but they actually delivered on it, promising power comparable to a PlayStation 2. Yes. Possibly. Hmm. Nintendo? Hmm. And right from the unboxing, you can see how serious Sony was about this mission. The PSP came in this value pack absolutely jacked with goodies. Reams of manuals, including a demo disc and a screen cleaning off, a soft pouch, a pair of actually branded PSP earphones to plug into the console's 3.5mm jack, there's a strap, I guess borrowing from the pocket station it came from, and even a meter remote that can go in between the earphones and the PSP to add physical control to it, a 32 megabyte memory stick duo card, and even a removable battery. Hmm. How can anyone hate tech from this era? 
Yeah. Then the console, which screams sleek, understated performance. Yes. And when you turn this thing on, it was like nothing the world had ever seen before. Yeah. It's hard to state just how insane this 4.3 inch LCD display was at the time. With a 24 bit color depth and 272p resolution, that's by the way 128 times the number of pixels versus the pocket station, and way more than the DS, it was very much cutting edge. Yeah. And actually very similar in quality to the first iPhone's display, except two years even before that. And, and Sony really, really took, took advantage, advantage of that display. Do you remember yeah, when I said, I said the Pocket Station had a 33 kHz CPU? Well, the PSP had dual 333 megahertz mm. CPUs. On a very basic level, that is easily eight times the performance of Nintendo's DS, and no joke, 20,000 times the performance of their previous console. I remember I bought my first PSP back in 2007. I actually had the Simpsons game on PSP. I don't think I had the, the OG one, the first one, but I think I had the 2000. It was black too. Not to mention the PSP had a proper console controller-esque analog nub, and that this was where Sony announced their brand new media format, called the Universal yeah, Media Disc, or UMD. And this was interesting. Yes. While the competing DS game cartridges could hold an absolute max upper limit of 512 megabytes of data, UMDs being basically like mini CDs could hold 1.8 gigabytes. Mm. And that meant not just that developers could run wild with their games, making the PSP the very obvious oh, yes. real gamer's choice against Nintendo, and racking up a ton of actually big name console-like exclusives, but also cemented the PSP as one of the best portable movie players around. Yeah. <sighs> Honestly, everything about the PSP generation just excited me. Everything felt so tactile and physical. And yes, I love that about gaming. Fun fact, this was my actual PSP carrying case that I used for my entire lifetime with the thing. Well, These UMD discs, I thought they were the coolest thing. Yes. Like this whole ritual of flicking open the pack, of slotting in the UMD and closing it back up. Sounds like heaven, ain't it? It's music to my ears. Right. And also, the fact that it could play movies meant that I still remember the feeling of browsing those blockbuster aisles, just finding the perfect Friday night movie to watch on my PSP. Yes. And if you go into the game tab and you click UMD, it's been so much time since I've heard that. One Ooh, classic trope. Now, I'm still looking for more PSP games. I'm still looking for more, man, because I'm trying to stack up my PSP collection. Look at the PSP that I'm remembering now. Is this scratching sound? That's the disc being yes, read. It was yes. all the time, but especially when you're on like a loading screen, which also used to last very long. So with subsequent consoles, when they replaced that with flash storage that was silent, it was a massive quality of life improvement. It's really hard to convey how much of an improvement this is from like the pocket station. You can totally see how people at the time were just blown away by this thing. Because yeah, this doesn't look quite as good as a PS2 game. It's very much got the same feel. It's got the same kind of scope in terms of the kinds of things you can do in it. The audio is also miles out of the pocket station. It's proper stereo sound. I'm getting slaughtered. <laughs> the analog stick as well is a massive quality of life improvement versus any other handheld that existed up until this point. It actually makes big worlds like this natural to traverse. You can also so tell when you're using this original PSP that it was absolutely designed with the PlayStation 2 in mind to look as consistent as possible so it could be the perfect companion. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all the odds were stacked against Sony when they launched, but they just so happened to create the perfect cocktail of what the world was looking for at the time. This thing far surpassed Sony's small town sales expectations, but it was still getting outplayed by Nintendo's DS. Okay. To which you might be thinking, why? We just spent two whole minutes talking about why the PSP was more advanced. And well, I think it's partly the games. Nintendo had the behemoth that was Mario, which yep. did half their job for them. I can't tell you how many school coach journeys I had, where the entire activity was just a massive eight-person Mario Kart multiplayer sesh, where incredibly out of those eight people, only one of them actually needed to own the game to do that. And partly also the price. Sony's hardware launched at nearly $400 in today's money, and that coincided with a pretty devastating Nintendo price drop to just $200 the very same year. Coincidence? I think not. So, Sony... Yep. They released a bunch of hardware revisions over the near decade of the PSP's lifetime, starting with the sleeper PSP 2000, or the slim one. This actually is my current PS5 right now, the, the color one is charging right now. And this is the console I grew up with. The number of hours I yes. sent into this machine right here, unspeakable. 
nothing even comes close. And actually seeing where it comes from, this feels like a massive leap. It's gone from 23 millimeters thick on the original to 18.6. And the weight of the thing is down from 280 grams to 189. And you feel that trimming a lot more with a console that you hold in your hand than you ever would on a home console. But it wasn't just slimmer. The PSP Slim came with the one major upgrade of assuming you had the right cable, being able to output directly into a TV. This is literally Nintendo Switch functionality in 2007. Sony is so ahead of its time. Yeah. You know what? The quality fares really well when translated even to a much bigger screen. Nothing about this looks in any way subpar. But this also reminds me of one of the things I used to spend so much of my time doing. Changing my fever. Tasty Treat applies a cookie theme to your entire device. Kind of adorable though. I had this theme too as well. The Sony wasn't done yet. It's very clear that Nintendo's DS Lite, which had very quickly overtaken the original DS in sales, was front and center of Sony's mind. They were clearly doing everything they could to try and bottle that magic into their console, which led us to just one year after the Slim, the PSP 3000. Mm, or okay. Slim and Lite. I always just imagine this is Sony grabbing a microphone and screaming, yes, we have Lite too. Notice also how the boxes get smaller each time, as Sony trims down what it's giving, and then also figures out how to cram what they are giving into as little space as possible. I've had this model too as well, I think I had a black one too. Now, I wouldn't call the Slim and Lite a revolutionary console, but considering it came out so soon after the Slim, these are solid improvements. Mm -hmm. A brighter screen yeah. with five times the contrast ratio and an anti bear coating, plus a microphone. You could literally Skype your friends oh, on your PSP. Yeah, this thing was so advanced, but it yes. still didn't sell in massive numbers. Mm. So Sony decided, screw it. People clearly want something that is actually as slim and light as the DS Lite. Mm. We're going to take that to the absolute extreme mm. with the PSP Go. And I oh, so remember seeing this thing in stores. I never owned a PSP Go, never owned it for the first time. Unbelievably excited that handheld this cool existed. Unbelievably jealous of anyone who actually got one. This thing, inspired by Sony's Milo personal communicator, is tiny. It's even cuter than my Milo communicator. And the form factor is just drool-worthy. This is one of the most robust, satisfying opening and closing mechanisms to date. Yeah, I love the design of PSP Go, no, no, no lie. I really like the design of it. It's even nicer than most foldable phones even today. But it did have a problem. See, PlayStation Portable as a platform, it wasn't designed with this level of portability in mind. You know, these UMD discs. Well, one of these, plus just the hardware required to read it, just that is nearly the size of this console. Yeah. So, they axed it. Yeah. The PSP Go couldn't play any kind of physical media, and you had to buy everything from the PlayStation Store. Yeah. To compensate, they did give you 16 gigabytes of inbuilt storage, which with PSP games, it could go quite a long way. But, I mean, if you think the world now is not ready for all digital gaming, the world then was definitely not. Any real gamer hated the idea, mm. and as gamers, we, uh, we like to let people know that. Mm. This thing was such a commercial failure, in fact, yeah. that even a very dramatic Hail Mary, buy a go and get 10 free games promotion by Sony wow. could not save it. These were 10 proper games, by the way, in total worth more than the console itself, but people just wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah. So, yeah, now we're at a, at a time, you know, digital gaming is happening right now and we're getting digital consoles, so I can see why it became a commercial failure. I can see why. To actually make sure they shifted the bulk of their PSP hardware before the next generation came out, Sony had to do the one thing they hadn't tried up until this point. Get I've seen this mod before, but never owned it. Getting the price down to the DS's level, the PSP Street, mm. which apart from the Go is, I think, the coolest looking PSP with this slick matte finish. And they've also done that while shaving the price down by about $100 with the removal of stereo audio, the brightness buttons, and actually even Wi-Fi. That sounds major, but for most PSP users, including myself, Wi-Fi was not really a big part of the experience, so this was a smart revision. It's just, this price cut, it needed to come much earlier in the console's life cycle, when people were still forming their opinions about the platform as a whole. I mean, the PSP at this point had been out for seven years, which is enough time that people were starting to turn their attention to what's next. And so the idea of a cheap version of the last-gen console with less features it's not exactly going to set the world on fire. Mm. But clearly, all of these console revisions, while none of them individually spectacularly successful, they did all pull together to push the PSP to a total sales number of 82 million consoles. Okay. Which for a company whose last handheld was little more than a fidget toy, is impressive. The stage was set, and hype was building for PSP 2. The PS Vita. Oh boy. Damn, Sony. Damn. 
ended up being cold for the PlayStation Vita. And with the PSP being my favorite console of all time, I cannot tell you how excited I was for this thing. This was their most underrated console, but they freaking, ooh, the disrespect they actually had for this console, man, <sighs> sucked. When I eventually got it in my hands, the hardware was every bit as spectacular mm -hmm. as I had dreamed. Yes. Let me explain. That one stubby little analog stick had become two much more substantial yep. ones. The entire back panel was a touch-sensitive layer to add another dimension of interactivity into games. Yep. It had six-axis motion control brought over from the PS3, front and rear cameras with face detection and head tracking, small cartridges instead of large discs, small 3G connectivity to take the social features to the next level, not to mention the materials. They went from cheap plastic to metal and glass in many areas. The PSP was already premium in my eyes, and so moving from that to this was like my entire worldview imploding. Yes. And then, the screen. The PSP to screen was its single biggest asset, a 5-inch, 544p resolution. That's four times the number of pixels of the PSP, capacitive, multi-touch panel. At the time it launched, it even felt ahead of many top-of-the-line smartphone screens, let alone the PSP. And this was also at a time where the idea of touch screens on devices that were non-smartphones was still very new and very exciting. So, how powerful was it? Well, take the PSP, and multiply it by 10. Yep. So yes, 200,000 times the population. This was a technological behemoth. Let's take it for a spin. Oh man, holding this in my hands, turning it on for the first time, it really takes me back to that moment when I first got my hands on one. I remember unboxing it for the first time and before touching the console, my hand was almost quivering because I spent so much time just fantasizing about it, watching this trailer again and again and again, just dreaming about what it would be like to be able to reach inside and grab the thing. This was this was my only main portable console I've owned ever since Get PSV. This is my only one I ever played a lot. So you turn it on with this really solid, actually metal button. Oh yeah, then they have this whole page tear unlock animation. I just think that was so cool. And one thing becomes very clear having just used the PSP, this is nothing like it. I think the PS Vita has paid very close attention to smartphones at the time, and it in a sense has tried to replicate the success of those. I just love how bouncy and filled with personality the user interface is. And one of the coolest things about this console is you no longer just have to do one thing at once. You could have multiple applications open. I remember being so excited excited by the idea of cameras. Yeah, I love oh, wow. that. <laughs> Zero <laughs> processing. <laughs> what you see is what you get. Okay, so now I'm going to load up Assassin's Creed Liberation, which is basically the PS Vita's equivalent of what we just played on the PSP. But the speakers are much better too. They were still good on the PSP, but here you notice that they have much more space for you to hear the different instrumentals. Oh wow, yeah. I mean, the clarity on the character model, the building, the amount of texture you see on screen at any one time is very clearly a generation ahead. Do you know, this also reminds me of one of the big problems I had with Vita, which is, it kind of hurts me to say, but I feel like developers were too ambitious. I feel like Sony, when they were marketing this console, they tooted the horn of, this is basically like PS3 power on the go. So, you know, developers built their games accordingly, like very ambitious, massive worlds, and it just couldn't quite handle it. And so it was such a common PS Vita trope for games to be really pretty, but just run up all frame rates, which, to be honest, you can even see right now. The Vita also had so many gimmicks, like the back touchscreen and the front and rear cameras, which I think they came with a lot of promise, like this idea of you will play augmented reality games and you're going to have some next level immersive experience, but it never really like happened. All that stuff kind of relies on Sony being able to convince developers to adopt it, and they just didn't. And so with any serious game like Assassin's Creed, we kind of would have just been better off without it and having saved costs on the console. If you could look past those compromises though, then yeah, the Vita was a tasty treat of the console. It was. And subs of the channel would be, well, and B. Hmm. And the best part is that it seemed like from the launch that Sony had also worked out pricing. Compared to the original PSP, which launched at the equivalent of $400 in space money, the Vita was 330 mm -hmm. by the same metric. So the stars were lining up, as were the pre-orders from core PSP fans. The PlayStation Vita was shaping up to be a firecracker of a console launch, with even exclusive games from massive brands like Uncharted ready to go day one. But then, as soon as this thing hit the mass market, the Vita fell flat. Yeah, Something had clearly it gone majorly wrong. I would put it down to three things. One, that while the price of the base console itself was reasonable for its tech, mm. the price of its proprietary Sony-made memory cards... Yes, the memory card price, Jesus Christ, because 
I think I remember I had Cody Vakos classified bullcrap game. I think you had to play, you had to get a memory card to play the freaking games. Like, what? You can't even play without it? Like, that was just like, why? It's not. You pay a full extra $100 to get a 64 gigabyte card, which feels like Sony's roundabout way of trying to recoup costs on the console. Two, the Vita has poor timing, partly because it was beaten to market by Nintendo's shiny new 3DS, partly because unlike the PSP, it was launching into a market where most potential users had just bought new smartphones and were enjoying the novelty of gaming on those, and partly because it was cannibalized by Sony's other products. While the Vita launched in Japan in 2011, it didn't hit the Western market till 2012, and this was not good because it's the very same year that the hype started overflowing for their next home console. Yep, pleasure to four, yep, or you're away. The PS4, which would launch in 2030. Yeah. And so the Vita had gotten people excited, those who bought one loved the hardware, but then the stage was swept from under its feet almost immediately. As soon as that happened, the Vita was already on the way down. But what finished it off was three, that the stream of games yeah. also followed. Yeah. Because the thing was so unique, it was a complicated, expensive platform to develop for. So who's gonna bother doing that the second you start to see the attention moving on? Credit where due, Sony did take one stab at revitalizing interest in the Vita and also correcting for the effective tax on storage. Mm -hmm. And that's the PSV very predictable yeah. point, PS Vita Slim. Which that's the current model I have right now, the black one. They decided to give its own internal storage so you didn't have to buy a memory card. An internal storage of one gigabyte. Yeah. <laughs> what makes it even worse uh, is that as soon as you start using an external yeah. memory card, you are effectively locked out of using that internal memory, rendering it completely useless as anything more than a buffer while you crawl away to a computer to drop a hundred dollars and wait for your Vita memory card in the mail. I think I saw eBay, they have a lot of freaking PS Vita memory cards that are pricey to this day. It's crazy. Well, yes, it's pretty cool that you can now have PS Vita power in a body that is way slimmer and 40 grams lighter. It's pretty clear that Sony didn't exactly pour their love into this provision. Because that lightness actually came at the cost of both the size of the rear touch panel and the quality of the screen. That black PS Vita looks nice as hell, though. With the console's prized. I'm sorry, the blue one. My bad. The blue PS Vita. Looks really nice. OLED display being swapped out for a less fancy, cheaper, less vibrant LCD. Sony stopped releasing sales figures after a while, which kind of tells you all you need to know. Yeah. Like they just want to shut their doors and pretend it never happened. But it's estimated that they only sold a grand total of 16 million PS Vitas in all. And that puts Sony in a bit of a pickle. Because when a console doesn't sell well, it doesn't make sense to invest millions building big games for it. But at the same time, if Sony did nothing and just let the thing die, then that erodes trust in their future consoles. This idea that they're only going to make them good platforms if lots of people buy them. So, they smartly pivoted the Vita away from being its own major platform and more towards being the recommended companion for the PS4 through remote play. I've, that's one of the features I love about PS4. You can play PS4 games on the Vita. I love doing that so much. I also set up this new indie-focused initiative to get as many lower-budget, smaller developer-made games as possible on both Vita and PS4. Because a lot of these games are very simple, both consoles could easily run them, and you can have cross-buy with the ability to pick up where you left off on one console on the other. And for these smaller indie games, the Vita did actually become the perfect platform to play them on. And it was such nice hardware that I know people still do to this day, which feels like as nice of an exit that the console could have had. Yeah. But just before we get to the next generation of handhelds, Sony had one more trick up their sleeve. I remember the PS TV, I never owned one. Before the PS used to die out. The weirdest handheld revision I've ever seen in my life. The PS. TV. Hmm. Essentially, the PS Vita handheld, just without the screen. Yeah. And the controls. Yeah. And the fact that it's handheld. So, yeah. you stood that down. You connect to it via your PS4 controller, which is actually kind of all the more confusing, because if you have a PS4 controller, you probably have a PS4. And if you have a PS4, why do you want a PS TV? Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a media box. It plays games, it watches movies, but it's going to watch movies that are lower quality than the PS4, and it's going to play games that were really designed with the portable form factor and the portable controls in mind. So, yeah, clearly this product was designed as a way to repackage the PS Vita's proposition to try and shift some more units of the thing's hardware that had already been manufactured. And to be fair, it's priced really generously. I just don't know what the exact uses, hmm. and this is actually a really good example of that. If I try and load up the same Assassin's Creed Liberation game that I just played on my PS Vita, it 
won't open mm. and not supported. It oh. must need some of the core PSD to hardware to actually function. I definitely feel like Sony also tried to borrow some of the things that made the Wii really successful. The kind of the way they frame the social features, but they never took off in the same way. Yeah. But the writing was on the bordering wall for Sony. And as far as handhelds were concerned, it said, don't bother. So for literally a decade, PlayStation fans retreated back into their living rooms, with Sony focusing all its efforts on the home console front. Yep. Until now. Yep, it's portal. The PlayStation Portal, Last year, the biggest box so far in the video, and really a completely new kind of handheld. I actually got my PS Portal earlier about February. I actually like it so far. It's great. It's cool. It's pretty cool so far. I know it got very divisive, you know, people read about it, but like, why is this made? Why not another PS Portal, I mean, portable console itself? I was like, yeah, I, I was feeling that too, but once I bought this, it was good. It was pretty good. Wow, this thing feels like a beast. Yeah, and in so many ways, this is worlds apart from Sony's other handhelds. Like, the screen is four times the resolution of the already pretty crisp Vita. They're no longer just good for a handheld, they are literally one-to-one -one with your actual PlayStation 5, including the same adaptive triggers that can let you feel tension. Yeah. The catch is that, well, it's empty. This thing doesn't play games yeah. natively, but it streams them from your PlayStation 5. Yeah. And while that might sound sucky, which I understand, and yeah. I know a lot of people online are saying this thing makes no sense, in a way it might actually be my dream console. Hmm. Okay, so every other console that I sat here in this chair and tested for this video I played with at some point before in my life. This is completely new to me. If you press on that and it opens up a very literal portal, I guess when it finds your console, you go through that. That is awesome. And the thing that I'm trying to discern here is how much or how little does this feel like I'm just playing on a handheld as opposed to streaming it? I mean, as far as the quality of the home screen is, almost indistinguishable. Every bit of text is crystal clear. Wow. Uh, I mean, this looks absolutely <laughs> insane. Mm. It's really hard to separate the fact that it's not running on this console. I mean, all I have in my mind is the PS Vita as our kind of point of comparison. And compared to that, this feels like not one, but three generations ahead. The latency between, let's say, when I move the joystick and the character moves is very low, to be honest. There's a tiny bit of lag, but not necessarily more than even games that aren't screening. I mean, just having like a wireless remote, for example, does introduce some latency. The only thing that does remind me that I am streaming as opposed to playing natively is the dynamic resolution. So it seems like what happens is every time you kind of turn around and it's got a... Ooh. Okay. Oh, do you know the, <laughs> the haptic feedback on that? Wow. So it seems like it's programmed to make its top, top priority to avoid lag. But Obviously, when you're doing things over the internet, naturally there will be points where you get high signal, points where you get low signal. So while the frame rate and the fluidity is pretty consistent, the quality, not as much. I know that for so many people this makes no sense, because you've already got the PS5 that can play the game, you've already got probably a bigger screen and probably a better sound system too. But for me, handhelds just give this feeling of freedom that you don't get with anything else. Yeah. It does very much look like if PlayStation made a Switch. Yeah, like it, it does, actually. the exact mirror of that. Massive tablet-like screen in the middle and then big controllers on either side. Mm -hmm. One thing I don't like about this is that it doesn't support normal Bluetooth headphones. Yeah, no. But apparently for the... That's the thing I didn't like about PS, PS Portal because it has no booster support. Like, come on, man. It's 2024, man. We should have handheld consoles with Bluetooth support. I'm so glad Nintendo did it with the Switch, finally. Purposes of latency, Sony saying that you can only connect directly to Sony headphones. Whether or not that's true, it would still be good to allow users the option to use something else. And dead. Now, when you're in a situation like this and you're relying very heavily on your home Wi Fi, there is a cool trick you can use to up your security. All right, W Video, Mr. Who's the Boss, W Video, man. Oh, man, seeing, seeing every PlayStation in hell ever, man. It makes so nostalgic as hell, man, because it's an interesting fact, very interesting facts that I even know. Wow. Because I actually own the PSP and the PS Vita Slim and the PS, um, P Slim. And it's like, damn, man. Damn, this sounds so nostalgic. And of course, I own the PS Portal, of course. But I got used to get the PS Portal because if I don't want to play a game on my TV, I get to use, you know, the PS Portal. And yeah, overall, man, this is great times. Great times PlayStation having a hell console. Such great times. So, Hot Squad, I'm going to call it quits for today. I am feeling tired. As I am feeling tired as hell. So, it's been a great run. It's been a great run today. I will continue more Heartbanger recaps tomorrow. So, with that being said, that is my conclusion of my Heartbanger recap reaction to Mr. Who's the Boss. I brought every PlayStation handle ever. So, if you enjoyed this, please hit my and share your thoughts. 
How many of the PlayStation and Portables you've ever owned handheld wise? Do you own the PS Portal? What's your thoughts about it? You know, and yeah, overall, this has been an entertaining video. W Video, who's the boss, keep up the great work with these. Shout out to you, man. So, all squad, this is your man, Taurus Hawk, signing out for today. Tomorrow, I will, like I said, continue with my Hawk Banger reacts. You know, like I said, I'm feeling tired. I can feel already. So, Hawk Squad, once again, this is your man, Taurus Hawk, signing out for today. See y'all later. Safe out the sky. Peace out, and have a great day.